Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm, I am totally excited to tell you about the making of the wave, which was turbulent, a turbulent ride, as you can imagine. Um, and we are, uh, I'm gonna go to the first slide immediately. Um, I started, uh, David, first slide, thanks. I started uh, thinking about waves in um, pretty early because I was an open water swimmer, uh, but I wasn't really expecting to what happened to me one day. Um, I guess it was probably about 1988. <laughs> I was surfing with some friends um, just outside of San Diego, and I thought I was pretty confident in the water, being a swimmer and everything, and I just got worked by this four-foot wave, like so badly that I ended up in the hospital for a week <laughs> in San Diego. So I was really aware of the power of waves, even little waves, and I, after that, I, I was sort of scared of them. And about um, five years after that, I found myself on the north shore of Oahu, uh, and I was happened to be there during a time that they ran the Triple Crown Big Wave Day at Sunset Beach. And Sunset um, is, a, you know, a wave that is, is a paddle in surfing wave. So they were surfing it that day, maybe 25, 30 feet. And I rolled up in my rental car and I got out on the beach and I saw this wave, you know, pretty far away. I'm standing on the beach and the undertow was just sucking the sand back off the beach. And the, the wave, when it would come down, even though it was quite far away, there was like a veil of mist in the air. And I was looking at this little person on this wave, and I couldn't believe how scary it was. I was terrified. I, I could not believe anybody would actually insert themselves into that element. And so I was pretty fascinated. I watched it. I never forgot that. It, it was like the same way that I never forgot the Farallon Islands. When I saw my first glimpse of them, which was on a BBC documentary, the group of very spooky islands that I wrote about in The Devil's Teeth, I, I couldn't get the image out of my mind, and I couldn't get the image of this wave out of my mind. Uh, about, again, about five years later, I ended up at Outside Magazine in Santa Fe, um, and we wrote a lot about extreme sports and adventure, and it, it, it was um, right around then that, that images of Laird and his friends and toe surfing started crossing our paths. And I remember being very uh, fascinated by some of these pictures for the same reason, like what is going on here? To see somebody on a 60 or 70 foot wave after I had been so terrified by a 25 foot wave, I, I really wanted to know more. And, and right around that time also tragically, um, Mark Fu died at Mavericks and we sent John Krakauer to write about that. And I, I became aware of this giant wave off the coast of California that, that, and these things always fascinate me, these sort of unknown, unheralded, extreme, beautiful and terrifying things in the ocean, just like the great white sharks. And I began to follow toe surfing um, fast forward to about uh, five years ago, I saw. Can you next slide? I saw um, an article in the New York Times, and the title of the article was "The Mystery of the Disappearing Tankers." And I read this article, and it talked about how very big ships, you know, freighters, oil tankers, things like that, were going missing at this remarkable clip. This this that was really inexplicable in a time when there's. GPS and satellite surveillance, and it seems like it would be almost impossible for somebody to just disappear off the radar. These ships were going down, and the scientist said in the article, at a clip that was like two ships a week, and he said, and nobody ever knows why, and it's lost, they're lost with all hands, and it's usually just put down to bad weather. But the notion was that it was actually rogue waves, and by rogue waves, uh, when I refer to them, obviously rogue waves are a different kind of giant wave. They're not the kind that the surfers are surfing, um, the toe surfers, but they are waves that exist in extreme conditions, just like the waves that the toe surfers are surfing. And they are highly unstable, and um, they can be two, three, and even four times as big as the seas around them. So it's like a wave, what happens to make a rogue wave is that a wave pirates the energy of all the other waves around it, and it becomes this sort of as I say in the book, teetering monster. And, and it's very unstable and it can break and it can break on a ship. And if it breaks on even an 850 foot ship, it can, it can destroy the ship instantly. It can actually break it into, uh, as one, one scientist told me, like a snapped pencil. And the, the ship is on the bottom of the ocean in minutes. And a lot of these ships, when they go down, don't even get a, enough time to send out an SOS or an EPIRB or anything like that. Um, could I have the next slide? So this is the kind of thing you really just don't want to see, you know, if you're a captain in your, your window. And I'm not, I don't even, that's not even really a rogue wave. That's just a big sea, a wave in a sea, store, a sea state in a storm. Um, can I have the next slide, please? This, um, another thing I had read about that 
uh, contributed to my interest in giant waves and to the decision to spend five years of my life trying to understand them. Uh, the QE2 in 1995 was hit by a rogue wave. It came out of 45 foot seas that were, you know, those are big seas. And that's bad enough. And even on an ocean liner like that, it's bad enough. But this wave was close to 100 feet. It was, uh, it hit the windows at the top there, blew them out. The, the captain who was uh, um, in charge of the ship saw it on the horizon. And he said it looked like the white cliffs of Dover. It was, it was just this wall with this little white thing at the top. And later in the presentation, I'll explain to you why I now understand what he meant when he said that and why I had also read in other accounts of giant waves, people often say, I saw this thing and I thought it was clouds, you know, or, or I thought it was a fog bank or I didn't know what this was or maybe it was land because when they get past about 50 or 60 feet, they start doing something very, very different and I'll, I'll show you a picture of that. Can I have the next slide? Um, and this is the kind of thing, this is a ship that was lucky. This is a ship that that came back and, you know, had managed, had giant wave had hold this ship completely but it hadn't, it hadn't impacted on the hatches, and, and what, they, what I eventually discovered when researching the book was that when the waves get so big that they breach the hatches, that they take the cargo in and out of, that, that destabilizes, when water gets inside the cargo area, it destabilizes it so much that then it's like this feedback loop of bad things that happen to the ship. The cargo, the bulkheads blow out, the thing gets, the, you know, can list, and all of a sudden it's, it's more vulnerable to the waves, and another one hits it, and the next thing you know, it's, it's done for. Next slide. Um, another kind of wave that I really was fascinated by and is, was the tsunami, and um, I write about them as well. The tsunamis were almost um, a, a, a mythical notion to us until 2006 when the tragedy in Indonesia happened, and I was kind of off the grid at that time, camping and surfing in very rural Mexico, and missed the first two um, or three days of news about the tsunami, but um, I had read an article about tsunamis years ago in Smithsonian Magazine, and remember looking at the flattened parking meters in Hilo, Hawaii, and thinking, a wave did that? Um, one of the statistics that I love from the book is, uh, is that uh, it only takes an 18-inch wave to topple a wall built to withstand 125 mile per hour winds, um, so that gives you a sense of how powerful they are. Uh, I, when I submitted that chapter, I remember my editor phoned me and said, he, surely you mean 18 feet here. And, and I said, no, it's, it's 18 inches. Um, and w but when the tsunami hit in Indonesia, I think everybody kind of leaned back and went, what, like, wh how could a wave have killed a quarter of a million people? How could a wave erase a city? But this is a lithograph from a, a wave, a, a tsunami um, in 1755, which in geological time is like yesterday or, you know, a second ago. Wiped out Lisbon, wiped out most of the Western Mediterranean, lot, some of North Africa and some of Western Europe, and really upended life for a very long time. In 1883, it was only 1883 that Krakato Krakatoa blew, and that sent up 140-foot tsunami around Java and Sumatra leveled that part of the world and killed a huge amount of people for that time, like 36,000, which is, you know, add a couple zeros now. But that 1883, I mean, they were publishing Ladies Home Journal in 1883. So, it, you know, in the, in the Lloyds of London agent had sent the Morse code saying giant wave coming. So tsunamis, as I've discovered, um, are really a regular feature of the planet. And, and one of the big things that I wanted people to come away from from the wave is not, is, first of all, I want it to be fun and entertaining, but second of all, I want people to think we, you know, we really don't know about, is not enough about giant waves. We don't know as much as we should. And considering that we live in such incredibly close proximity to the ocean and, and that it's the most powerful element on our planet, it controls the weather, it, it affects every aspect of every part of our lives, even to people who do, may not realize that. Around here, obviously, you do. But uh, the notion is that, that I believe so strongly in is we, we gotta, we've got to understand this better and we've got to respect it better. Um, another thing that was happening that intrigued me was I, w I was reading about oil rigs taking tremendous abuse and the sort of signal event, this is an example of one in the North Sea, this is not the Dropner oil rig, but the Dropner oil rig in 1995, New Year's Day, North Sea, just off the tip of Norway, was hit by a wave that was 84 feet, which not so extreme in the North Sea, but what was unusual about that particular day was it was only 32 or 33 foot seas. So, 
and, and the other thing that was really important about that event was that that oil platform was rigged with lasers. And so the measurement, all the waves that hit it were being measured.